Welcome to video number 17 in the Calmness Mind series, where today we're going to explore making sense of our senses. And as you're well aware, anxiety and OCD tend to cause a lot of doubt within the mind of that person, meaning that they often need reassurance. They dislike feeling out of control, and they get stuck in catastrophizing loops about what might happen next. They then fear the body's natural physical response to the biological release of adrenaline and cortisol from all their, all their worrying, um, and it sends them into spiraling loops of worry and fear. And I've been urging you up to this point to consider what are you really in control of anyway? And I really want you to get into the mindset that it's okay to feel out of control. It's okay to be out of control. That's what living life is all about, you know, making the most of what life throws at you. Maybe even stirring it up a little bit to see if we can't create new opportunities. And you know that if the body releases adrenaline, it will evoke a feeling of fear and that that's normal. And you know that your brain is currently erroneously wired to see danger where other people don't see danger at all. Okay, so then why would you be scared of the feeling of anxiety? You know, the body's natural response uh, to all these chemicals that have just been released at the wrong time. And could you see how, how your body feels could be irrelevant? And you can say, oh yeah, my brain just accidentally triggered the release of a few chemicals. Therefore, rather than fearing my feelings, how can I start to reprogram my brain? Okay. And in addition, why would you be worried about events or outcomes that haven't happened yet? Okay. Why would you be running negative stories in your mind about the past that make you feel sad rather than running happy stories that could make you feel good? And if how we feel is largely based on the chemicals in our blood, why are we not doing everything we can in our power to trick our bodies into releasing good peptides and hormones uh, naturally, regardless of the truth of any story we use to make that happen? And then as we stop running negative stories and we start introducing new positive ones, our cells will begin to think that the world out there is getting better, is less dangerous. So it will allow for the deregulation of stress receptors on our cells and the increase of receptors for more happy peptides. And this is what lifts depression, like we discussed in video number seven. Unless as best we can, we try to influence the production and the release of our own feel-good chemicals, we are just passengers to what our conditioning or what life throws at us. And I think that's sad when there is so much that we can do to reprogram ourselves. Remember too that this course is not about exploring the truth about anything. It's about exploring what can you actually to do to change how you feel? Uh, what can you do to change how you think? And how to expand yourself to overcome fear so that the experience of your life can change. Rather than fear and embarrassment or even fear in death, how, why, how might we fear missing out on the richness of life, on love or travel, uh, companionship, connection, creation? Are we missing out on just the feeling of just being? Can the heaviness of depression become a lighter emotion that drives us towards our intentions? Do you even know what you want from life? Can the fear of, an of anxiety be swapped for a gentle calmness? Can the rigidity and the control of OCD be exchanged for the agility to be able to respond to life in many different ways, depending on what life throws at you? Can the skill range of your personality be expanded or even extended to incorporate the behaviors of other characters, like your a settler becoming more warrior or the nomad becoming uh, more playful? Can our bodies be made less dense by releasing trapped trauma, okay, which will change the frequency with which we vibrate at and encourage a more intrinsic health within, within ourselves? Rather than asking, how do I make my anxiety or OCD go away? Can we ask, what do I need to do to become a new person in which anxiety and OCD would struggle to survive. Remember, anxiety, metaphorically, is a parasite. It feeds off of fear. So how do we change how we think, how we behave, 
our values, our beliefs, our perspectives, how we socialize, how we conduct our relationships, how we work, and importantly, how we can find more peace within ourselves. So to really master some of these skills, we need to go back to basic principles, and in particular, to our senses, because they are our primary tool for experience in life. And if we can explore how they function, we can begin to optimize them to be working in our favor. So our senses, do our senses tell us the truth? Um, or do they just guide us? Can we trust our senses? Uh, should we trust our senses? Um, how accurate are our senses? Because the truth is quite shocking. And if you really want to get out of anxiety and OCD, I genuinely believe that creating a new relationship with your senses is key to your recovery. So let's explore our senses beginning with our eyes, sight, vision. And although what I'm about to say is taught in school, most people seem to forget that we don't look out of our eyes. Nothing comes out of our eyes. It's a one-way street where light comes into our eyes. Light emitted from some light source reflects off of an object and goes into our eyes. And these two separate streams of data you know, from each eye are digitized and sent as an electrical impulse down the optical nerve to the back of the brain where the occipital lobe uh, resides. Here, they're reconstructed, stitched back together. <laughs> Gaps where your nose was and where the blind spots from your optical nerve are, they're filled in with the brain putting in a guess of what would have been there. And a 3D visual representation is made in the back of your brain of what's out there. So we don't truly see what's out there. Just our brain's best guess, our brain's best interpretation. What we see out there is actually the image made in our own brain. And it's not the reality of what's out there. But it feels so authentic. Even though the image is in our brain, in the darkness of our brain, in our skull, it feels like we're looking out of our eyes and seeing it out there, but it's not. We just see the picture in our head. And to make this even more incredible, the object we're observing, you know, that which the light is bouncing off of, doesn't have any color. Color is something that, that our eyes add as they decode the varied spectrum of light waves bouncing off of the differing uh, reflective or absorbent surfaces of the object or the person that we're looking at. You need to really think about this. Our brain is making a best interpretation of what's out there. However, we believe that interpretation is reality when it's not, okay? And our response to that interpretation feeds our thoughts and our thoughts feed our emotions, which of course feed our behaviors. At worst, we're just cherry picking all the negative things. Um, let me give you an example. Let's say an OCD person uh, with a conditioned brain uh, walks into a kitchen and the brain may present an image where a full waste bin or dirty plates or some food or, or some splash of food on a tile uh, or a grubby dishcloth on the table is what's center of attention. Whereas another person uh, in the same kitchen may notice the pretty window blind, the quarry floor tiles and a packet of chocolate biscuits on the side. What we see or don't see is determined by how we were conditioned throughout our life. We see what we're expecting to see. You could say that there is an objective reality that's happening out there, and then there's a virtual reality, a subjective reality, a story we make of that reality in the back of our head. Plus we add additional stories to that story based on our beliefs about ourselves, who we ought to be, or how we were trained to see life. Can you see how error prone this can be? But also, what a huge opportunity to rewire and to reprogram ourselves. Once we can see with new eyes, um, virtual eyes, we can condition our brain to see things differently. And even when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we don't see the reality of what we look like we see a representation that our brain makes of us, along with all our conditioned stories about who we look, how we look and who we are. I, I, I personally found it liberating when this realization sunk in. Firstly, it doesn't matter what I see when I look in the mirror because nobody else is seeing that same representation. 
Yeah? Really, when I look in the mirror, all I've got to make sure is there's no spinach in my teeth. Okay? Plus, I'll never know what anybody else sees when they look at me. For all I know, you know, what they're seeing is I'm incredibly handsome. And that's the story I tell myself uh, lovingly and playfully. You know, like I've been saying all along, it feels better to placebo yourself for good feelings than bad ones because it really does affect your subsequent behaviours. Can you see too how easy it is for our unconscious mind to trick us? We're looking for our car keys on the table, but our mind hides them. You know, we can be looking directly at the keys, okay? but remember, we're not looking out of our eyes. Okay? We see what our mind lets us see, because our little eight-year-old may have a wonderful time sabotaging what we see in our mind to their agenda. And this is like how hypnosis works. If the hypnotist says, you won't be able to see me, the guy on the stage's brain is just erasing that picture of the man in the image created in his mind. He's not looking out of his eyes and not seeing him. He's looking at the image in his brain that has been easily modified. It's like the brain using its own copy of uh, Photoshop to delete the person. And of course, the more the person believes the hypnotist, the more likely his mind is to be tricked. So you can see how important the role of our beliefs are in what we see about the world, other people, uh, and of course, ourselves. What we think is reality is just our virtual reality created by our brain, manipulated by our beliefs, and conditioned by our stories. You need to really, really think about this. Can you see now how normal it is to have um, a hallucination? Everything we see is an hallucination. Our dreams are an hallucination. The world is our dream. We are making our internal dream of ourselves and the world either horrible or lovely. Which way are you doing it? Because either way, it's still a dream, so you may as well make it a good dream. Perhaps, too, you can glimpse how conditions such as schizophrenia, psychotic delusions, or recreational drug hallucinations can now become far less scary when you realize that all of your vision is just a rich visual interpretation, all happening within your brain that can easily be influenced by ingested chemicals, beliefs, opinions, our personalities, um, or our emotions. Our settler will see a different virtual reality than our nomad. One wants to fit in and follow rules, the other one wants to stand out and bend rules. In fact, rather than being scared by an hallucination, Perhaps we should be thinking, wow, how cool is my brain? How creative am I? I wonder you know, if I can make this scary story safe or this safe story scary, okay? Just for fun. What about great horror book authors and filmmakers like um, Stephen King or Steven Spielberg? If their brains were proposing thoughts of harming, killing, or sexual abuse, they would be thinking, excellent, I can turn these daydreams into a book. Yet a person with OCD who had similar thoughts might be afraid to spend time with their family because they fear the daydream is about themselves and that they may do these terrible things. Thoughts are just thoughts. We don't get to choose them, but we do get to decide how we interpret them or whether to ignore them. A quick note here about OCD intrusive thoughts about harming or abusing other people, which by the way are very, very, very common. The chances of you doing these things are very slim. Yes, there are people out there that do that sort of thing, and they're called psychopaths, which means they lack remorse or concern for other people. So the very fact that you are concerned that you might do this means you're not a psychopath and you won't do this. It's just a trick of your OCD to stop you from getting on with your life yeah? and reminding you to try and stop thinking because negative thinking is exhausting your emotional energy battery like we talked about in video four. Now then, the brains of people who are kind of glass half empty pessimists have become conditioned into unconsciously searching for all the things that could go wrong and then presenting them to be the focus of what they see and where the person place, places their attention. And that's why so much of my work now is teaching you how to change your story, how to adjust your inner dialogue, how to placebo yourself with positivity um, and with gentle love. Can you see how to become a, a glass half full optimist uh, 
would make so much more sense because the world their brain, brain creates through their virtual reality leads to more pleasant thoughts and a calmer, happier set of feelings. And remember too that our sight is linked directly to our amygdala, which is why what we see can instantly kick off a fear response, okay? Which is why the vision exposure therapy taught in video, video number eight is so very, very powerful. And I'd recommend you spend a lot of time moving your trigger images from the unsafe to the safe amygdala database via repetition, visualization, and the, the tapping that I taught you earlier on. As the mathematician and philosopher Rene Descartes approximately said, he said, there's the world as it is, and there's the world as we see it. And another of his quotes that I, I like is, an optimist may see light where there is none, but why must the pessimist always run to blow it out? It took me quite a long time to master living in both worlds, the objective world out there and my subjective world in here. They're both real in their own ways. However, it's in my inner subjective manipulation of the world where I can make the biggest difference to my own calmness. It's far easier for me to change how I see the world than to change the world to be how I want to see it. And I truly hope you can begin to see how, how fluid, how transient, um, how creative, how reprogrammable, how malleable and how influenceable our own brains are. But we have to consciously retrain them. Okay, we have to consciously retrain our unconscious. Just because we consciously know something doesn't mean the unconscious knows it too. No, we have to spend time consciously reprogramming our unconscious until that new program becomes updated and takes over. Repetition, repetition, and more repetition of a positive message. Let's stay with our senses a little longer and perhaps explore our hearing, because I think that's often uh, overlooked, especially by those who have experienced psychotic episodes or who take a lot of medication. Uh, sounds called vibration, vibration waves which go into our ears, and then our brain compares those, those vibration patterns to a database of known sounds and words, thus decoding their meaning. So you say, oh yeah, that's the, the sound of a dog barking, or wave comes, oh yeah, he said, uh, have, you, have you seen my keys? Now, as with sight, sound also goes through our amygdala, and loud noises or a person shouting may set off an amygdala alarm to get you ready for some form of danger. However, certain sounds may be stored erroneously in the amygdala's unsafe database. So, for example, um, a scary teacher from school may have had a strong foreign accent. And then when another person speaks with a similar accent or a similar tonality, it might set you off. Or perhaps a parent may have criticized you when you were young, might have said something like, hey, what are you doing that for? Uh, and once again, if somebody says a similar phrase, it can be triggered from your amygdala. So remember too, like memories, sounds can also be moved from the unsafe database to the safe database of the amygdala via the exposure therapy. Now, another hypothesis of mine, which pertains to psychosis, uh, is that many people who experience anxiety and OCD are heavily medicated, especially with sedatives. It's to calm their anxiety down. And these sedatives turn down the responsiveness of our senses. Pain gets numbed and our reactions become numbed and dimmed uh, as well. And for some, this sedation may alter the frequency that the incoming noise is registered at, which means that this modified frequency is forwarded to the brain for decoding uh, via pattern matching, but there's no match. So the brain either jumps to a fear response because it's an unrecognized sound, or it latches to the nearest match for the erroneous frequency. Um, let me see if I can explain that better by giving you an example. Uh, I remember once being heavily sedated after outpatient surgery and I was standing in my kitchen and all I could hear was a voice in my head whispering to me with a Scottish accent. A person was talking to me inside my head and it wasn't me. And this really startled me until I realized it was the noise from my dishwasher being incorrectly pattern matched in my brain 
due to my hearing being slightly sedated. Now, in that instance, I just <laughs> smiled to myself, but I could so clearly see how another person could have become quite psychotic about those perceived voices and turned them into further scary stories and started a whole new anxiety loop. So can you see background noises from fans, air conditioners, traffic, or just the general sound of life could be misunderstood by the brain in some medicated individuals, which may lead to a continual and fearful confusion and dissociation. But there's an answer behind it. So what I'm pointing to is our senses are not reliable. Our brain is a wonderful interpretation tool, but it's very open to errors from its conditioning, um, from its chemical balance, from its single perspective myopia, which we might call our beliefs. You could say our brain, uh, our mind is our sixth sense, which pulls all the data supplied by all our senses together and tries to make an understanding of them then it unconsciously decides for us what it thinks our best plan of action may be and gives us that information in the form of thoughts and feelings. And as true as those thoughts and feelings may seem, they're just our programming in action. They are just an interpretation. And all this goes on automatically, unconsciously, within our little horsey. But the good news is, uh, as the rider, we can override what the brain suggests what the thoughts propose and what the mind predicts will happen next. We can observe all this unfolding. We can see how the body responds to those thoughts, how the triggered fear responses from our amygdala flood us with chemicals. And we can watch the stories as our little horsey tells himself about everything and realize it's all just a giant virtual reality. So my question to you is, which version of the virtual realities will be best for your happiness. And as I keep saying, you are the observer. You can be calm regardless of the whole routine unfolding beneath you. It's not your problem, it's the horses. And you as a rider can silently move towards the outcomes that you are looking for in that moment, regardless of how the horse feels or the stories that she's telling you. <laughs> this reminds me of a nomadic prank I performed on a, a playful friend of mine which resulted in quite an unexpected consequence. Uh, my friend had a massive fear of heights, and one day I engineered for us to emerge from a car park into a shopping centre at a place where we were four storeys up and where the down escalator had a glass side wall which exposed the drop all the way down to the ground floor. And I kept him distracted, uh, and as we suddenly stepped onto the escalators, um, of course, his fear exploded, and uh, I thought I would add to, uh, well, to my fun by leaning right over the railing and saying, oh my God, it's a really long way down there. And um, in his panic, he just grabbed me by my belt and pulled me away and restrained me until we reached uh, the next landing, where he was really angry and maybe a little bit laughing. Uh, and he said to me, John, if you knew how scary that was for me, you wouldn't have done that. And I said... Well, I do know how scary that is. And I grabbed his hand and I placed it over my heart, which was pounding with fear because I dangled over the edge of the, of the escalators, four floors up. And he said, why is your heart racing? He said, you're not afraid of hearts. And I said, no, no, I'm not afraid of heights, but my body is. And he just looked at me blankly. And he said, I thought people who were okay with the heights didn't get fearful responses. And I said, no, no, they're just okay with what the body does. They might even call that sensation uh, excitement. And with that one realization, we went back up the escalator and came down again. And he realized that his mind could be calm even though his body wasn't, okay? So wonderful to see a whole internal dream change for a new one in just a matter of minutes. And you can do the same. How many fixed beliefs do you have that could be changed just by altering a perspective or changing your attitude or learning something new, changing a belief? Now in video nine, I introduced our atomic battery and explained that trapped trauma makes our body dense and lowers the natural frequency that we vibrate at. And for some of you, this might sound a bit weird. However, you've come this far with me, so 
let's keep an open mind. And I went on to teach you in video 15 why it's so important to release this stuck energy so we can become less dense and raise our natural frequency, which we might call emotional and physical health. To put this into a more graphical representation, let's look at the effect of frequency oscillation and sound on matter. So if we hook up to a speaker, a metal plate, and then place sounds at various frequencies, watch what happens to the sand that is sitting on top of that plate. As we adjust the tone and the frequency, it takes random particles and forces them into astonishing and beautiful patterns of nature. Why? Because there's information in energy and because sound is energy. And what we need to understand is that our voice and our thoughts, they have a frequency. It's often outside of our hearing capabilities. And the frequencies we send out uh, through what we say and through what we think organize our matter into coherent patterns, which we might call health, or incoherent, messy patterns, which indicate disharmony in the body, which we might experience as illness or distress. And this is why I'm pointing out that we need to discharge our trapped trauma, which enables our natural frequencies to be attained through raising our vibration. Plus, if your internal and external dialogue becomes that of a soft, gentle, loving, and positive nature, this raises the frequency that we vibrate at, as well as raising the frequency of those around us. And at specific frequencies, we can even see matter acting the way our universe does, forming into spiraling galaxies with arms that reach out and wrap around. Why? Because everything is energy, and sound is energy, and our thoughts are energy too. And if we pass sound through iron filings, they take on form and they act together, similar to how all the, the separate atoms in our body act together, okay? All the time that we have a cohesive resonance, uh, which we might call health. So making our bodies less dense through releasing trapped energy, by finding cohesive resonance through calmness, and then changing our thought patterns to be kind, open, loving, and permissive is a whole new era in biological health, okay? And it evolves along with the recharging of the energy that allows you to get on with the life you really want to live, like we talked about in video number four. So, thoughts have energy, words have energy, your perspective and your actions in any moment have power, and do affect matter and the resonance of the people around you. We will be exploring this um, in more detail in later videos, but for now, just consider this. How we think, how we talk, and how we behave does give off a frequency vibration, which may be high and in resonance, which is natural and life affirming, or our thoughts and actions may emit a low frequency, a chaotic resonance, which is life diminishing. Let me give you some examples. You could be impatient, which is low energy and tiring, or you could be tolerant, which is high energy and encompassing. You could be forever planning and worrying, or you could just start creating. You could feel limited and stuck, or unlimited and boundless. You could rigidly defend a belief, or you could grow a value or a belief. You could blame a person or take responsibility. You might be careless and haphazard, or disciplined. You could be reactive or detached, demanding or just having a preference, critical or accepting, fearful or brave, condemning or forgiving. How you see the world, how you talk to yourself and how you behave set up within you an energy frequency that at a biological level will fill you with energy and life or it will suck it out of you and those around you. And as you let go of trying to control life, more energy will become available to you and through you. You just need to stop resisting it and just let it in. So a quick summary. Our senses are not necessarily the truth. What we see is the virtual reality our brain constructs for us in our head, not necessarily what's out there. 
our beliefs, our opinions and our stories are added to that virtual reality model in our brain. Okay. And our brain proposes thoughts and feelings that try to help us to consciously choose what we do next. But we don't need to listen to them. There is the world out there and there is the world in our head. And we need to learn to live in each of them. And finally, what we say and what we think are energy fields. And I'm urging you to consider, are your conscious thoughts negative and life diminishing or positive and life affirming? To say, I love you, is a very different energy field to receive than hearing, I hate you. Be it to others or yourself. And that's your homework. How can you begin to consciously work on a new internal self dialogue that is kind and positive, regardless of what your unconscious mind is proposing and regardless of what you might actually truly believe at this moment. So when your unconscious mind says you're an idiot, you consciously talk over that old story with a new one that says, no, no, I'm a lovely person. Be creative. Imagine you are talking to your own child. What positive language would you be using with them so that their self-esteem is emboldened? And then I'd like you to consider your external dialogue with others. How can you jazz it up a bit? How can you add more energy to it? If they say, where should we go tonight? Rather than saying, oh, I don't mind, try saying, you know what? I'd love to go to that pub that's down by the river. Shall I ring up and see if I can get us a, a seat by the window? Now, I don't care if you feel down and I don't care if you feel anxious about going out, but remember you're changing yourself. Okay. And that change starts here. And in addition, consider how the other person will feel if they heard such a direct and enthusiastic uh, response, that positive energy will lift them, which will also change how they begin to treat you. Can you see how life is a game? It's a dance. And if you're smart, you'll start playing that game uh, in new ways. How can you make positive dialogue a game with your partner that you're not allowed to moan or um, you're not allowed to complain? You have to turn every interaction into a positive statement. You might say, oh, that was lucky. That could have been so much worse. Or how lucky are we that we can go out for dinner? How wonderful that we have running water. Now, I know in the beginning this will feel a bit false, a little bit hammy, but you'll soon be surprised what happens when you stop complaining and start positively accepting that what is happening now around you is what's happening around you. And if you can put a positive spin on it, it just feels better. That way your story changes, your vibration changes, it increases, your partner sees you differently and your partner starts treating you differently. Okay. You start releasing more positive peptides uh, within your body. So your chemical soup changes and the cells begin to produce more receptors for those happy peptides. It just makes sense. Now in my next video, I'm going to really go to town on how we change our beliefs and how we reprogram our brain uh, for more positivity, um, like I've been talking about throughout this whole video. As ever, it's my pleasure to be working with you. Thank you all so much for your support. Um, please spread the word that these videos exist. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks very much.